Okay, well, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Emma Harbour, the Global Advocacy Director for the Rainforest Alliance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session of the Global Landscape Forum. Over the next four hours, we have a programme that will bring together people from across the globe looking at the challenges and opportunities we face in creating a more sustainable world. In particular, we will be focusing on why alliances are key to making lasting change. It's in the name, but it's also in our DNA. Alliances are at the heart of our work within the Rainforest Alliance. From the very beginning, we knew that we could not change the world alone, that we must look for our allies, that we must build alliances, and we must understand those that did not share our vision if we were to really influence change. We are now a diverse alliance of producers, supply chain actors, governments, and consumers who together want to see a world in which we thrive together people and nature. In these current times, this seems more relevant than ever. We see that it is only by working together, recognizing each other's strengths and abilities, checking out egos and brands at the door, and being open to identifying where we can support and learn from each other, that we can build and rebuild in a way that will cont contribute to a sustainable future for ourselves and future generations. At the Rainforest Alliance, we work with a wide range of communities and partners to implement programs and projects at a landscape level. One of these, the 1000 Landscapes for 1 Billion People program, looks to go even further, aiming to shift the system to position integrated landscape partnerships at the center of development and environmental strategy. When combined with the work we do with supply chain actors, whether traders, roasters, buyers, or retailers, to connect the consumer with the producer through certification and the use of the Rainforest Alliance seal, and of course, our advocacy agenda, looking to influence policies to enable a smart mix of regulation, voluntary measures and investments. We believe together a more sustainable and equitable world is possible. Today's program will highlight how alliances are critical to this shift and how our partners are playing a role in this. Our first session looks at why gender is key to a sustainable landscapes and food production systems. We will be hearing from our gender lead, Yoki Francois, and sector partnership coordinator, Nina Rossiana, about how, through an integrated gender approach, we have seen significant changes within the landscapes we work in in Indonesia. However, we start today with an inspiring and thought-provoking conversation from women who will likely lead us in the future. Wilelai Hoshai Sure is an indigenous activist and law student from the Paitia Sure people in Brazil. In December last year, with other women from her community, she took her call to change for change to the world governments at COP. Here she is in conversation with the Rainforest Alliance's Catarina Vieira. Olá, boa tarde e muito obrigada por teres tirado este bocadinho para conversar connosco e obrigada por teres partilhado a tua música. Um, podes falar-nos um bocadinho mais sobre ti e sobre a tua vida como ativista? Boa tarde, muito obrigada pelo convite. Meu nome é Lela Roitai, Suruí, sou do povo Suruí, de Rondônia. Né? E a... o meu trabalho com ativismo é uma coisa que é que é desde pequeno, desde que eu nasci, porque os meus pais são ativistas. É, a minha mãe é coordenadora da organização Canidé e o meu pai é cacique do meu povo. Então, é uma coisa que vem desde pequenininho, né? É, e eu acho que lutar pelos nossos direitos não, quando se nasce indígena não é uma coisa que a gente escolhe, mas cada um tem o seu jeito de lutar, né? Esse é o meu jeito. E o lugar que eu, que, eu, que eu decidi trabalhar é nesse ativismo, exatamente nesse, como uma juventude jovem e mulher indígena mesmo, né? sempre buscando os nossos direitos. A primeira vez que a Rainforest Alliance te conheceu foi com, através de um convite que te foi feito um, para vir à COP, à COP25 em Madrid, do ano passado. Um, Queres-nos falar um bocadinho sobre a tua experiência nessa conferência, sobre o que aconteceu e uh, como é que te sentiste lá e o que é que trouxeste de volta para casa também nessa experiência que tiveste? 
É, foi a primeira vez que eu fui para a COP, né? Então, foi uma experiência muito, muito legal para mim, muito engrandecedora, né? É, mas é claro que, apesar da, da boa experiência, a gente vê coisas e observa coisas, como, por exemplo, é, lá na COP a gente tem vários espaços, né? E aí tinha um espaço para a comunidade, um espaço para a comunidade indígena também, é, que era o chamado... Era a ala verde, né? E, só que essa ala era, ela era separada das, das demais alas, que, que são as alas de, de discussão, né? Então, é, eu acho que, ainda que se, isso foi intencional, né, não teve intenção, é uma coisa se pensar, né? Porque a, a ala da comunidade indígena e do, das demais comunidades, da organiza, das organizações, é separada das demais alas, né? Das alas de discussão. É, que, que a comunidade deveria estar participando, deveria estar presente ali, né? Mas claro que a gente também teve é, coisas boas, por exemplo, é, foi a primeira vez que foi tantas mulheres, né? A nossa delegação era mais de 20 pessoas, em sua maioria eram todas mulheres indígenas, isso foi muito legal. É verdade, e, e também como mulheres indígenas, e tu em particular como uma jovem mulher indígena, certamente que tens encontrado muitos desafios no teu percurso. Um, Queres-nos falar um pouco de, de quais são estes desafios enquanto mulher indígena e talvez como é que também os ultrapassas? Sim, então, como mulher, é, a gente sempre tem que provar mais o dobro do que os homens, né? Sempre. É, eu acho que toda mulher sabe disso. E como mulher indígena isso não é diferente. Pelo contrário, isso é até maior, né? Porque a sociedade ela ainda tem é, esse, esse preconceito é, dos indígenas, né? A forma como eles veem, veem o indígena, principalmente aqui no Brasil. É, que nas escolas os indígenas são ensinados que ah, o índio ele ele é ele é desse jeito né e as pessoas é que acreditam que o índio é preguiçoso e aí não tem nada disso né é, o indígena é totalmente diferente e, a gente, e então a gente tem que lutar contra isso também né como mulher e como indígena e aí também tem a questão de ser jovem, né? A gente que é jovem, nós duas, sabemos como é difícil, às vezes, é, ter a nossa fala respeitada exatamente é, para as pessoas não acharem que a gente é, tem é, o poder daquele conhecimento, né? Que, que a gente tem aquela sabedoria exatamente por, por sermos jovens. Então, eu acho que... Os maiores desafios são esses, né? É se colocar como mulher, jovem e indígena nos locais mesmo de poder e de fala e de discussão. E, e aí a gente está exatamente lutando para desconstruir isso, para ter sempre mais mulheres em locais de fala e de discussão, não só eu mas que tenha mulheres em todos os aspectos, tenha mulheres nas discussões importantes como a COP, mas também tem mulheres indígenas, médicas, é, advogadas, psicólogas, em todas as áreas, né? E isso é uma coisa que a gente também vai construindo juntas, né? Como mulher. E, e como é que fez um, o papel das pessoas indígenas, especialmente neste caso de mulheres ou de jovens, uh, quando chega a altura de lidar com desafios uh, como a deflustração da de, de Amazônia ou como as alterações climáticas, que papel é que tu vês uh, das mulheres e dos jovens neste, neste assunto? Então, o papel das mulheres e dos jovens é muito importante. Exatamente agora que a gente está conseguindo conquistar um pouco esses espaços de poder, né? E de fala. E as mulheres 
e, e as mulheres jovens indígenas, né, e as mulheres indígenas, elas são, elas estão no, no centro, né, dessa discussão, porque elas é quem estão na base sofrendo é, com essas mudanças climáticas, né. É, a gente que está lá nas terras indígenas sofrendo é, as consequências disso. Claro que todo mundo sofre. A gente também tem que entender que isso não vai afetar só os povos indígenas, mas que as mudanças climáticas vão afetar o mundo inteiro, a vida de todas as pessoas, né? Mas que a gente acaba sofrendo mais porque são as nossas terras que estão sendo desmatadas, que estão sendo invadidas, né? E a terra dos povos indígenas. E se você pegar as pesquisas os mapas, você vê que ainda o pouco de floresta que resta é onde os povos indígenas estão. E as mulheres têm um papel importantíssimo nisso, porque elas têm um papel importantíssimo dentro da comunidade indígena. Né? As mulheres trazem uma sabedoria é, que só a mulher indígena tem, né? e mais ninguém tem. Nós estamos completamente de, de acordo contigo. Um, finalmente queria te perguntar se há alguma mensagem que gostarias de deixar uh, para os participantes desta conferência, para as pessoas que nos estão a assistir hoje. Primeiramente eu queria agradecer o convite, né, no nome da, da Leila e a você também que está aqui e de toda a Erin Flores, né, que me convidou e que está proporcionando essas discussões, né, que está dando espaço exatamente para as mulheres indígenas falarem e é essa a mensagem que eu fico que eu deixo né é, deem espaço escutem os povos indígenas escutem as mulheres indígenas escutem os jovens indígenas né é, eles têm uma, uma mensagem importantíssima para passar né principalmente nesse momento tão é, difícil que a gente está passando agora Valela, muito obrigada pelo teu tempo e pelo teu testemunho e até uma próxima. Até. Dentro da mata tem lei Dentro da mata tem rei Quem fere a mata e a lei do mato ferirá o rei também Dentro da mata tem lei, dentro da mata tem rei, quem fere a mata e a lei do mato ferirá o rei também. Hello, good afternoon and good morning everybody. My name is uh, Yoki Francois. I am uh, working on gender equality within the Rainforest Alliance, and I'm very happy to be part of this event. I would like to thank you all for your participation, and I hope you will enjoy the rest of the session. So after this very inspiring interview, we are now going to have a look into the importance of gender equality within sustainable landscapes and sustainable food production. Uh, we will have a little uh, presentation. I will now... Uh, stop my video to be able to give space to the presentation. Many of us, of course, have heard about gender equality and many have heard about sustainable landscapes, about sustainable food production. We normally see it as very separate issues, but we as a Rainforest Alliance actually see that those two are very interlinked. Sustainable landscapes and sustainable food production cannot take place if we don't take into account gender equality. And what we are going to have a look at now in this session is how this can take place, what kind of strategies can be implemented and what have we learned so far from our experiences in the field. So when we talk about uh, food production, we need to talk about uh, family farms. Family farms are playing a very important role in the food production. They produce up to 80% of the food on the level of the whole world. And within the families, uh, there are male and there are female members. Male members are often very much uh, in, in, uh, responsible for cash crops, for crops that are uh, generating income, and they are in involved in activities like finance, investments, etc. Women, on the other hand, are often uh, responsible, the main responsibles or the only responsibles for food production, 
they are uh, involved in the production of food for the family and sometimes are selling some surplus on the local market. And in practice, we see that the activities that are related to those two different sectors are often very much uh, in, uh, <clears throat> separated on an individual basis. Men and women are taking part of that in their own context. But besides uh, the role that women play in food production, they are also often very much involved in the operational activities that are related to cash crops, like sowing, like weeding, like harvesting. And besides that, they are also uh, responsible for, for practically all uh, household squires, like fetching water, fetching fuel wood, um, uh, taking care of the sick, the old and the children, uh, cooking, etc. So that actually means that there's a huge uh, time poverty for women. And besides that, they are often dealing with a lack of access to inputs, resources and services like land, like credit, like training. Now let's connect this information with what we know about regenerative agriculture active, uh, techniques and climate smart agriculture. Quite some of these techniques are very labor intensive. You can think about uh, permaculture, you can think about agroforestry or ecological agriculture. And often these techniques are also requiring long-term investments like the planting of trees. And for women, it is difficult to invest in those kind of techniques because they often have so many responsibilities that they don't have the time to do that. And also, they, because of their lack of access to land, to credit, it makes it difficult for them to, to make long-term investments. This situation actually implies that the very people who are responsible for our food production, the female farmers, uh, have a limited possibilities to make this production sustainable. It also means that their qualitative contribution to cash crops can only be limited because they don't have the time, the knowledge, nor the interest to apply more sustainable techniques in many cases. So in short, gender equalities lead to a lack of uptake of sustainable agricultural techniques by practically the half of the farm population. And this is a huge bottleneck for sustainable food production. So what happens if you add to this situation the current crisis we are dealing with, the climate crisis and the crisis that is related to the coronavirus, the COVID-19 crisis? And of course, the climate crisis is affecting everyone. But if we look at female farmers, they are specifically affected because they are not only involved in crop, uh, cash crop production, but also in food crop production and in firewood fetching and, and water fetching which are all assets that are being impacted heavily because of the, cli the extreme climate uh, circumstances. Also, in re with regards to the COVID-19 crisis, we see that all are, of course, impacted by the crisis, but women are much more impacted because they are more likely to be infected because they have to take care of the, of the sick. They have to go out to look for food and fuel wood. So they are more likely to be in contact with sick people. And they are also, deal with even more time poverty because activities become more complicated and time consuming. They have to do homeschooling, etc. And on top of that, uh, we see an increase uh, in gender-based violence at home uh, because of the crisis, because of the uh, increased stress, lack of loss of income and uncertainty. But it's also important to take into account that women can be important uh, agents of change because of their key real role in households and in communities. Moreover, they're often more permanently in the, in the community than men who often migrate, which also means that they can give follow-up to activities and can play an important role in observation of changes in biodiversity, for example. So they can play an important role in early warning systems. So what can actually be done to improve gender equality, to, to improve uh, better access to inputs and resources for female farmers. And of course, uh, the first thing we think about is to improve access to finance and training as a solution. And this is, of course, a good solution, but it's not uh, enough. Because if you um, improve the, the access to uh, finance, you, you also the female farmers will also need to invest more time in the training and in more labor intensive techniques. And time is simply what they don't have that much. 
On the other hand, they need to know if, if their investments will really uh, be worthwhile, if they will be able to pick the fruits, if the land, the trees that they have been uh, caring for will still be belonging to them when, when the harvest is ready. So multiple conditions need to be in place for women to invest in sustainable food production, not only access to finance, but also time availability and interest in long-term investments. And for this to happen, it's important to work with both men and women uh, to raise their awareness about the importance to work together to uh, share um, tasks and responsibilities and have a common vision. Uh, and also to support women and their organizations to become stronger and to let their voice hear and demand for better conditions and, uh, and services. So what can be done to create the necessary conditions to be able to do this, to make uh, women and men work together and to come to these stronger organizations? We as a Rainforest Alliance have been working with different uh, strategies uh, to improve gender equality on the level of the households, the, the communities and the cooperatives. And we are going to have a look at some of them. One of the strategies we've been working with are the so-called household approaches uh, of what, which uh, GALS or the Gender Action Learning System is one example. Household approaches are um, supporting men and women to work together towards a common vision. And we will talk about it a bit later uh, in more detail. Another strategy we have been working on is the strengthening of women's organizations to make them stronger with uh, capacity uh, by linking them to relevant actors so that they are able to um, represent other females and put their issues on the agenda. And as a last uh, strategy we would like to mention is uh, advocacy, uh, linking up with relevant stakeholders like local governments, companies, etc and trying to influence them, making them aware of the importance of working on gender equality and making sure that they incorporate that in their the policies and strategies. We are now going over to Indonesia and we will have a little chat with uh, one of our, our Rainforest Alliance colleagues uh, there, uh, Nina Rosiana, who is manager of sector partnerships. She is uh, the main responsible of the sector partnership program that is active there and which is financed by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. She's working in the coffee and cacao se sector around different issues of which uh, gender is mainstreaming and she has a lot of experience with the GALS methodology. Hi Nina, uh, we would like to uh, have a little chat with you. Thank you very much for joining us. We, we know it's quite late for you. Um, we have now been talking a little bit about the GALS methodology, but could you explain to us what it actually means? What, what is it about? Absolutely. Thank you, Yoki. And good evening from Indonesia. Um, I was just checking um, my, my clothes from, from the previous picture, making sure we don't, I don't wear the same clothes. But anyway, GALS, um, Gender Action Learning System or Gender Action Learning for Sustainability was developed and piloted by Linda Mayo in Uganda back in 2002. Probably many of the audience heard or practiced this before. It is a community-led empowerment methodology using principles of participatory visioning and planning. And in the implementation, we provide a safe space for women and men farmers, as well as young generation of farmers to develop new visions and challenge injustice related to resources and power. In the end, it's about peer support groups, farmers supporting other farmers. It, that, it does not differ greatly with the many gender projects out there where women's meaningful participation in activities are highlighted and promoted. GALS offers the tools and techniques to set up the environment where empowerment can happen. It pays attention to the nitty gritty and what ifs. Many times we argue and ask ourselves whether our gender indicators are the truest and most sustainable and actually change something. GALS tools help us take these questions to our farmers help them elaborate what they feel the answers are. Instead of us sharing what we think changes, the farmers tell us what change should look like. Empowerment that does not add multiple burdens to either women or men, create frustration of leadership expectation or any expectation others instill towards women, men and our young farmers. It is basic psychology that long-term motivation comes from within. At first, the dreams are abstract, but GALS tools help make them measurable, visible, and communicable. Yoki. Thank you, Nina. Yeah, as you said, uh, 
uh, GALS is really about um, bringing men and women together to work towards a, a common dream. And as you can see on the pictures, it, it works a lot with uh, visual metho methods to make it easier for people to uh, discuss together about what they are envisioning for their future. So um, based on your experience, could you also tell us what actually changed because of the application of this methodology in the field? What did you see happen? Well, we were very fortunate. We were given the opportunity to, to experience this in the field through our sector partnership program supported by the Netherlands government. And we also have help from a GALS expert in Pandarmati who were directly trained by Linda. I think she's uh, in the audience. In one of our seven projects in Indonesia, few weeks after the workshop with farmers, I could already see actions and consistent motivation. We first started this in the northern part of Sumatra Island together with our local partners, and again in Bali, Sulawesi, and hopefully soon South Sumatra. Just before the movement restriction due to COVID in the beginning of March this year, it's been a challenging year and uh, it, it's only half of it. I had the pleasure of visiting several farming villages, spoke with some women and men, made some notes myself. First at household level, there was a clear understanding what each family member's responsibilities are, how additional home or farm tasks are underlined as additional time allocation, how caring for children, home and social events are understood and have values even beyond economy value. In the farm, a few months ago, we were gathering 25, 30 people, women and men, and some young farmers. Um, the men were actually joking among themselves how some men have done poorly washing clothes, breaking dishes when washing, and some complained looking after young kids without their wives were very exhausting. The women also made the same comments, masks and jokes, that the standards of which men must be this and that, be blamed if the family was poor or their kids could not go to school, if they did not go to farm when they were sick, they're considered weak. Those were ridiculous. We dissect gender roles and burdens both in farms and at home. Uh, and they all agree, some girls' results, farm level, there's increase of productivity. We have means to calculate increase of productivity. We measured around 30%. But if you go to the field, there were multiple answers. Some would even mention increase of 300%. Why these varying answers? Some would say, we work together, my, my husband and I, we take turns working in the farm, at home, our older kids as well, we motivate each other because we have a plan. We have a, we have a plan for extra money that we're going to get, what plan what each of us would save for, uh, for our future plan to start side businesses, crop diversification, and plan for spending. These plans have actually come true. For example, one family made a plan to increase productivity another 200 kilograms per hectare. They reach even more. They plan to buy a cattle, bought two actually, plan to, uh, to stop overspending on items that all family members agree is non-essential and they did so. When making decisions, women and men farmers also talk about risks and solutions. As a team, they came up with alternative income ideas to buffer price drop or other shocks. In one of our working areas, farmers have demonstrated a practical capacity of speaking deliberately, negotiating terms, and presenting themselves better in government offices, assisted by our local partner organization. Meetings with governments to advocate equal rights of women and men, we managed to gather intersectoral department at regional level, where each department's committed to start gender pilot project mainstreamed in departmental program. As, at line, as, as good as it sounds, long way to go to monitor these promises that this, this promise is actually delivered. And it is our responsibility as well as opportunity to keep in check that these happen. Yoki. Thank you, Nina. It's really fascinating to see how many uh, things are actually changing in such a short time. Um, and if you look at uh, sustainable agricultural programs, uh, do you think it is uh, useful to have this uh, GALS methodology implemented there? Absolutely. Farmers, especially in remote areas, they do not bother reading policy documents or getting the most updates of regulation or subsidy program available out there. We ask ourselves why. Why are they not aggressively striving to improve their own access to assistances, to, assistances, to finance, to market? And it could be as simple as illiteracy or not used to be involved in state matters or feeling unimportant. GALS techniques that we learned unearth these issues. Uh, 
gives gives a sense of importance to individuals in the family, gives meaning and motivation through visioning. The vision is not only to increase yield, but aspirations that are probably too small in a project to think about. Like for instance, women could would come up with a suggestions that men should ask permission for from women if they want to cut trees or change commodities, to take loans or to buy cigarettes or drinks. Basically, decisions on farm investment should be made together. And this also includes their children who are not given a chance to influence decisions, but are unpaid labors in the farm, making them reluctant to continue farming business and prefer to work in cities as, as laborers or drivers. All this visioning creates a close reality for women and men, and they can send message better and they get their community support and in the end increases their ownership to development initiatives, whether to increase productivity, protect the environment, rights, rights, rights advocacy, and more. I hate to stereotype, but honestly, the women, the women I work with shows more care for nature and obvious steward for trees, forests, rivers, and some of God's tools give them the opportunity to communicate this need to care for nature and others. Yoki. Thank you, Nina. And maybe to, to conclude this, uh, this interview, could, could you tell us what, what you think it's, why is it necessary to work with a household methodology like girls? What would happen if you would not do it? Well, thousands and even millions of dollars have been spent by multiple development actors and companies sourcing from farms and forests. In fact, billions spent to improve the productivity of Indonesian coffee or cocoa to give it a boost to an industry that is dominated by over 75% smallholder farmers. But we see that sector sees and provides services unequally. And sometimes development indicators are very much top down. From our experience, not only this method makes it possible for women, men and young farmers to shine. It also gives results related to increasing farm productivity, clear ideas and plans to protect nature and shared responsibilities that are just and fair for all based on what they aspire to be. In why household, simple idea of sharing burdens and workloads relates to family spending and investment towards farm improvements. And we always say this profusely, families are the first layer of enabling environment for empowerment. Gulls highlights visioning of what a personal future would look like. This personal future is frequently set aside and considered unimportant, especially in farming groups. But a linkage between job and self-aspiration is key to long-term motivation and endurance. Yoki. Thank you so much, uh, Nina. I think you gave a very good picture of uh, what girls could look like in, in practice. Thank you so much. You. We are now going to travel to uh, Ghana, where we are also having our uh, sector partnership program and where local colleagues are working together with uh, co cooperatives, with farmers and with local NGOs uh, to work around different issues in uh, the, the cocoa industry. And here, um, the farmer couple of Esther Agweya and uh, Abdul Rahim are telling their story about how their life changed due to girls. This video uh, will be sent to you in a link at this moment in, uh, in the chat box. This is a Mrenu Kwanen Mnai Gusui Trechena and Tiasia Bayaj Mama. Almost on which in a hun, dear co, Tigusa, a treacher, and any mean in a gusso, say, or man, a man, or dear, say, a moon in a pet. It's a gradual process for those communities who have received training. You see some changes. Um, I wouldn't say hundred percent, but uh, we are happy about the fact that we see some changes. Mm -hmm. Say a banana, dear, yes, and a crenty. Me jack is in same in guns with me jack punch of one. Never be clear with me, yam near money be a mammy. Could any one so with me for my old mammy? It is a boom baby. Where her crown been in the air, nay, is Cassim. Or the normal be a seal. So, yeah, dear, yeah, dear, sir. Ain't he? Men, no, sir, sir. If you are. And on a young crack, I swear they've had in Crown School. And Tina San Egg Mabum. And your common, sir, will be of her between who say, Baby, who are in the same medium. A moment, fair. 
Awareness raising, discussions, and trainings on gender equality are slowly leading to the first changes, not only within farmer organizations, but also within the household. Better communication between husband and wife about income spending and better division of tasks leads to more peace in the household and a more balanced workload between women and men. Process okay, finally, uh, to make uh, results long lasting, it is important that we create allies. We need to create allies, of course, with the farmers and with the communities, but we also need to create allies with the government with a, a research institutes, with companies, with donors, consumers, etc., to share and exchange best practices and learnings, and to be able to demand for better conditions for farmers, female and, and male. And we also, of course, need to, to be able to uh, create a, a strong alliance to internally as an organization, and be able to uh, incorporate our learnings and best practices into our own programs and projects. So concluding, uh, food, uh, sustainable food production cannot be achieved without looking into uh, gender equality. And gender equality is much broader than just improving access to training and to financial resources. It's about collaboration. It's about sharing tasks and responsibility. It's about changing attitudes, creating enabling conditions and tailored approaches. We have now come to the end of this session. Um, I would really like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, I'm able to respond to that still. So um, a question from the chat is how women can be, how women can be convinced to participate in sustainable landscape in communities where they don't permit work beyond the home and where they can't own land. Um, well, this, this is of course a very limited situation. Uh, it, it will happen a lot in Islamic countries where women are not easily allowed to go into the field to work, but we must consider that uh, the home yard is often uh, the, the domain of the women. And in the home yard, um, there a lot of things can be done. You can think about uh, the so-called one uh, cubic meter gardens, very small home gardens that are uh, growing crops in a very intensive and sustainable way and can actually uh, achieve a uh, sustainable uh, production of vegetables for the whole family. You can also think about uh, um, the, the growing of trees that are useful for women, like for shade or for fuel or for fodder for the animals that they need to take care of. So within that, the space where women are able to move, uh, it is possible to ex ex exactly work with those techniques that are intensive and, and sustainable. Um, I think I'm now going to give the floor to Emma. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Yoki, uh, Nina, Katrina and Walela Haite. I hope you'll all agree that this is an interesting start to the discussion and how by only including all members of society, including women and indigenous people, can we really start to make a positive change. This is the end of our first session. We will now be going into a short break and resume the next session at 3 p.m. While you're on this break, please do check, check the chat um, box within Hoover, where you will see a link to um, an upcoming event the Rainforest Alliance is uh, throwing, a house party, a virtual house party next week, where you will get the chance to hear more about uh, the work that we've been doing with alliances across the globe and hear from some of the inspirational partners we have. We will resume the session at 3 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>